Hellas Vygotsky, Thought and Language, Chapter 5, An Experimental Study of Concept Formation, Part 1. Until recently, the student of concept formation was handicapped by the lack of an experimental method that would allow him to observe the inner dynamics of the process. The traditional methods of studying concepts fall into two groups. Typical of the first group is the so-called method of definition, with its variations. It is used to investigate the already formed concepts of the child through the verbal definition of their contents. Two important drawbacks make this method inadequate for studying the process in depth. In the first place, it deals with the finished product of concept formation, overlooking the dynamics and the development of the process itself. Rather than tapping the child's thinking, it often elicits a mere reproduction of verbal knowledge, of ready-made definitions provided from without. It may be a test of the child's knowledge and experience, or of his linguistic development, rather than a study of an intellectual process in the true sense. In the second place, this method, concentrating on the word, fails to take into account the perception and the mental elaboration of the sensory material that give birth to the concept. The sensory material and the word are both indispensable parts of concept formation. Studying the word separately puts the process on the purely verbal plane, which is uncharacteristic of child thinking. The relation of the concept to reality remains unexplored. The meaning of a given word is approached through another word, and whatever we discover through this operation is not so much a picture of the child's concepts as a record of the relationship in the child's mind between previously formed families of words. The second group comprises methods used in the study of abstraction. They are concerned with the psychic processes leading to concept formations. The child is required to discover some common trait in a series of discrete impressions, abstracting it from all the other traits with which it is perceptually fused. Methods of this group disregard the role played by the symbol, the word, in concept formation. A simplified setting substitutes a partial process for the complex structure of the total process. Thus, each of the two traditional methods separates the word from the perceptual material and operates with one or the other. A great step forward was made with the creation of a new method that permits the combination of both parts. The new method introduces into the experimental setting nonsense words, which at first mean nothing to the subject. It also introduces artificial concepts by attaching each nonsense word to a particular combination of object attributes for which no ready concept and word exist. For instance, in Axe experiments, the word Gatsun gradually comes to mean large and heavy, the word Fal, small and light. This method can be used with both children and adults, since the solution of the problem does not presuppose previous experience or knowledge on the part of the subject. It also takes into account that a concept is not an isolated, ossified, changeless formation, but an active part of the intellectual process, constantly engaged in serving communication, understanding, and problem solving. The new method focuses the investigation on the functional conditions of concept formation. Remat conducted a carefully designed study of concept formation in adolescence using a variant of this method. His main conclusion was that true concept formation exceeds the capacities of pre-adolescence and begins only with the onset of puberty. He writes, quote, We have definitely established that a sharp increase in the child's ability to form, without help, generalized objective concepts manifests itself only at the close of the twelfth year. Thought in concepts, emancipated from perception, puts demands on the child that exceed his mental possibilities before the age of twelve. Close quote. Axe and Remat's investigations disprove the view that concept formation is based on associative connections. Axe demonstrated that the existence of associations, however numerous and strong, between verbal symbols and objects is not in itself sufficient for concept formation. His experimental findings did not confirm the old idea that a concept developed through the maximal strengthening of associative connections involving the attributes common to a group of objects and the weakening of associations involving the attributes in which these objects differ.
Axe experiments showed that concept formation is a creative, not a mechanical passive process, that a concept emerges and takes shape in the course of a complex operation aimed at the solution of some problem, and that the mere presence of external conditions favoring a mechanical linking of word and object does not suffice to produce a concept. In his view, the decisive factor in concept formation is the so-called determining tendency. Before Ack, psychology postulated two basic tendencies governing the flow of our ideas, reproduction through association and perseveration. The first brings back those images that had been connected in past experience with the one presently occupying the mind. The second is the tendency of every image to return and to penetrate anew into the flow of images. In his earlier investigations, Ack demonstrated that these two tendencies failed to explain purposeful, consciously directed acts of thought. He therefore assumed that such thoughts were regulated by a third tendency, the determining tendency, set up by the image of the goal. Ack's study of concepts showed that no new concept was ever formed without the regulating effect of the determining tendency created by the experimental task. According to Ack's schema, Concept formation does not follow the model of an associative chain in which one link calls forth the next. It is an aim-directed process, a series of operations that serve as steps toward a final goal. Memorizing words and connecting them with objects does not in itself lead to concept formation. For the process to begin, a problem must arise that cannot be solved otherwise than through the formation of new concepts. This characterization of the process of concept formation, however, is still insufficient. The experimental task can be understood and taken over by children long before they are twelve, yet they are unable until that age to form new concepts. Ack's own study demonstrated that children differ from adolescents and adults not in the way they comprehend the aim, but in the way their minds work to achieve it. D. Usnadze's detailed experimental study of concept formation in preschoolers also showed that a child at that age approaches problems just as the adult does when he operates with concepts but goes about their solution in an entirely different manner. We can only conclude that it is not the goal or the determining tendency but other factors unexplored by these researchers that are responsible for the essential difference between the adult's conceptual thinking and the forms of thought characteristic of the young child. Uznads points out that while fully formed concepts appear relatively late, children begin early to use words and with their aid to establish mutual understanding with adults and among themselves. From this he concludes that words take over the function of concepts and may serve as means of communication long before they reach the level of concepts characteristic of fully developed thought. We are faced then with the following state of affairs. A child is able to grasp a problem and to visualize the goal it sets at an early stage in his development. Because the tasks of understanding and communication are essentially similar for the child and the adult, the child develops functional equivalents of concepts at an, at an extremely early age. But the forms of thought that he uses in dealing with these tasks differ profoundly from the adults in their composition, structure, and mode of operation. The main question about the process of concept formation, or about any goal-directed activity, is the question of the means by which the operation is accomplished. Work, for instance, is not sufficiently explained by saying that it is prompted by human needs. We must consider as well the use of tools, the mo mobilization of the appropriate means without which work could not be performed. To explain the higher forms of human behavior, we must uncover the means by which man learns to organize and direct his behavior. All the higher psychic functions are mediated processes, and signs are the basic means used to master and direct them. The mediating sign is incorporated in their structure as an indispensable, indeed the central part of the total process. In concept formation, that sign is the word, which at first plays the role of means in forming a concept and later becomes its symbol. In Axe's experiments, this role of the word is not given sufficient attention. His study, while it has the merit of discrediting once and for all the mechanistic view of concept formation, did not disclose the true nature of the process, 
genetically, functionally, or structurally. It took the wrong turn with its purely teleological interpretation, which amounts to asserting that the goal itself creates the appropriate activity via the determining tendency, i.e., that the problem carries its own solution. Part 2. To study the process of concept formation in its several developmental phases, we used the method worked out by one of our collaborators, L.S. Sakharov. It might be described as the method of double stimulation. Two sets of stimuli are presented to the subject, one set as objects of his activity, the other as signs which can serve to organize that activity. In some important respects, this procedure reverses Ack's experiments on concept formation. Ack begins by giving the subject a learning or practice period. He can handle the objects and read the nonsense words written on each before being told what the task will be. In our experiments, the problem is put to the subject from the start and remains the same throughout, but the clues to solution are introduced stepwise with each new turning of, the, of a block. We decided on this sequence because we believe that facing the subject with the task is necessary in order to get the whole process started. The gradual introduction of the means of solution permits us to study the total process of concept formation in all its dynamic phases. The formation of the concept is followed by its transfer to other objects. The subject is induced to use the new terms in talking about objects other than the experimental blocks, and to define their meaning in a generalized fashion. Part 3. In the series of investigations of the process of concept formation begun in our laboratory by Sakharov and completed by us and our associates Kotalova and Pashkovskaja, more than 300 people were studied, children, adolescents, and adults, including some with pathological disturbances of intellectual and linguistic activities. The principal findings of our study may be summarized as follows. The development of the processes, which eventually result in concept formation, begins in earliest childhood, but the intellectual functions that in a specific combination form the psychological basis of the process of concept formation ripen, take shape, and develop only at puberty. Before that age, we find certain intellectual formations that perform functions similar to those of the genuine concepts to come. With regard to their composition, structure, and operation, these functional equivalents of concepts stand in the same relationship to true concepts as the embryo to the fully formed organism. To equate the two is to ignore the lengthy developmental process between the earliest and the final stage. Concept formation is the result of a complex activity in which all the basic intellectual functions take part. The process cannot, however, be reduced to association, attention, imagery, inference, or determining tendencies. They are all indispensable, but they are insufficient without the use of the sign, or word, as the means by which we direct our mental operations, control their course, and channel them toward the solution of the problem confronting us. The presence of a problem that demands the formation of concepts cannot in itself be considered the cause of the process although the tasks with which society faces the youth as he enters the cultural, professional, and civic world of adults undoubtedly are an important factor in the emergence of conceptual thinking. If the environment presents no such tasks to the adolescent, makes no new demands on him, and does not stimulate his intellect by providing a sequence of new goals, his thinking fails to reach the highest stages, or reaches them with great delay. The cultural task, per se, however, does not explain the developmental mechanism itself that results in concept formation. The investigator must aim to understand the intrinsic bonds between the external tasks and the developmental dynamics and view concept formation as a function of the adolescent's total social and cultural growth, which affects not only the contents but also the method of his thinking. The new significative use of the word, its use as a means of concept formation, is the immediate psychological cause of the radical change in the intellectual process that occurs on the threshold of adolescence. No new elementary function, essentially different from those already present, appears at this age, but all the existing functions are incorporated into a new structure, form a new synthesis, become parts of a new complex whole. 
The laws governing this whole also determine the destiny of each individual part. Learning to direct one's own mental processes with the aid of words or signs is an integral part of the process of concept formation. The ability to regulate one's actions by using auxiliary means reaches its full development only in adolescence. Part 4 Our investigation brought out the ascent to concept formation is made in three basic phases, each divided in turn into several stages. In this and in the following six sections, we shall describe these phases and their subdivisions as they appear when studied by the method of double stimulation. The young child takes the first step toward concept formation when he puts together a number of objects in an unorganized conjuries or heap in order to solve a problem that we adults would normally solve by forming a new concept. The heap, consisting of disparate objects grouped together without any basis, reveals a diffuse, undirected extension of the meaning of this sign, artificial word, to inherently unrelated objects linked by chance in the child's perception. At that stage, word meaning denotes nothing more to the child than a vague, syncretic conglomeration of individual objects that have somehow or other coalesced into an image in his mind. Because of its syncretic origins, that image is highly unstable. In perception, in thinking, and in acting, the child tends to merge the most diverse elements into one unarticulated image on the strength of some chance impression. Claparede gave the name syncretism to this well-known trait of child thought. Blonsky called it the incoherent coherence of child thinking. We have described the phenomenon elsewhere as the result of a tendency to compensate for the paucity of well-apprehended objective relations by an overabundance of subjective connections and to mistake these subjective bonds for real bonds between things. These syncretic relationships and the heaps of objects assembled under one word meaning also reflect objective bonds insofar as the latter coincide with the relations between the child's perceptions or impressions. Many words, therefore, have in part the same meaning to the child and the adult, especially words referring to concrete objects in the child's habitual surroundings. The child's and the adult's meanings of a word often meet, as it were, in the same concrete object and this suffices to ensure mutual understanding. The first phase of concept formation, which we have just outlined, subsumes three distinct stages. We were able to observe them in detail within the framework of the experimental study. The first stage in the formation of syncretic heaps that represent to the child the meaning of a given artificial word is a manifestation of the trial and error stage in the development of thinking. The group is created at random, and each object added is a mere guess or trial. It is replaced by another object when the guess is proven wrong, i.e., when the experimenter turns the object and shows that it has a different name. During the next stage, the composition of the group is determined largely by the spatial position of the experimental objects, i.e., by a purely syncretic organization of the child's visual field. The syncretic image or group is formed as a result of the single element's contiguity in space or in time, or of their being brought into some other more complex relationship by the child's immediate perception. During the third stage of the first phase of concept formation, the syncretic image rests in a more complex base. It is composed of elements taken from different groups or heaps that have already been formed by the child in the ways described above. These newly combined elements have no intrinsic bonds with one another, so that the new formation has the same incoherent coherence as the first heaps. The sole difference is that in trying to give meaning to a new word, the child now goes through a two-step operation, but this more elaborate operation remains syncretic and results in no more order than the simple assembling of heaps. Part 5. The second major phase on the way to concept formation comprises many variations of a type of thinking that we shall call thinking in complexes. In a complex, individual objects are united in the child's mind not only by his subjective impressions, but also by bonds actually existing between these objects. This is a new achievement, an ascent to a much higher level. When the child moves up to that level, he has partly outgrown his egocentrism. 
He no longer mistakes connections between his own impressions for connections between things, a decisive step away from syncretism toward objective thinking. Thought in complexes is already coherent and objective thinking, although it does not reflect objective relationships in the same way as conceptual thinking. Remains of complex thinking persist in the language of adults. Family names are perhaps the best example of this. Any family name, Petrov, let us say, subsumes individuals in a manner closely resembling that of the child's complexes. The child at that stage of development thinks in family names, as it were. The universe of individual objects becomes organized for him by being grouped into separate, mutually related families. In a complex, the bonds between its components are concrete and factual rather than abstract and logical. Just as we do not classify a person as belonging to the Petrov family because of any logical relationship between him and other bearers of the name, the question is settled for us by facts. The factual bonds underlying complexes are discovered through direct experience. A complex, therefore, is first and foremost a concrete grouping of objects connected by factual bonds. Since a complex is not formed on the plane of abstract logical thinking, the bonds that create it, as well as the bonds it helps to create, lack logical unity. They may be of many different kinds. Any factually present connection may lead to the inclusion of a given element into a complex. That is the main difference between a complex and a concept. While a concept groups objects according to one attribute, the bonds relating the elements of a complex to the whole and to one another may be as diverse as the contacts and relationships of the elements are in reality. In our investigation, we observed five basic types of complexes which succeed one another during this stage of development. We call the first type of complex the associative type. It may be based on any bond the child notices between the sample object and some other blocks. In our experiment, the sample object, the one first given to the subject with its name visible, forms the nucleus of the group to be built. In building an associative complex, the child may add one block to the nuclear object because it is of the same color, another because it is similar to the nucleus in shape or in size, or in any other attribute that happens to strike him. Any bond between the nucleus and another object suffices to make the child include that object in the group and to designate it by the common family name. The bond between the nucleus and the other object need not be a common trait, such as the same color or shape, a similarity or a contrast, or proximity in space may also establish the bond. To the child at that stage, the word ceases to be the proper name of an individual object. It becomes the family name of a group of objects related to one another in many kinds of ways, just as the relationships in human families are many and different. Part 6. Complex thinking of the second type consists in combining objects or the concrete impressions they make on the child into groups that most closely resemble collections. Objects are placed together on the basis of some one trait in which they differ and consequently complement one another. In our experiments, the child would pick out objects differing from the sample in color or in form or in size or in some other characteristic. He did not pick them at random, he chose them because they contrasted with and complemented the one attribute of the sample which he took to be the basis of grouping. The result was a collection of the colors or forms present in the experimental material, e.g. a group of blocks, each of a different color. Association by contrast rather than by similarity guides the child in compiling a collection. This form of thinking, however, is often combined with the associative form proper, described earlier, producing a collection based on mixed principles. The child fails to adhere throughout the process to the principle he originally accepted as the basis of collecting. He slips into the consideration of a different trait, so that the resulting group becomes a mixed collection, e.g. of both colors and shapes. This long, persistent stage in the development of child thinking is rooted in his practical experience, in which collections of complementary things often form a set or a whole. Experience teaches the child certain forms of functional grouping, cup, saucer, and spoon, a place setting of knife, fork, spoon, and plate, the set of clothes he wears. All these are models of natural collection complexes, 
Even adults, when speaking of dishes or clothes, usually have in mind sets of concrete objects rather than generalized concepts. To recapitulate, the syncretic image leading to the formation of heaps is based on vague subjective bonds mistaken for actual bonds between objects, the associative complex on similarities or other perceptually compelling ties between things, the collection complex on relationships between objects observed in practical experience. We might say that the collection complex is a grouping of objects on the basis of their participation in the same practical operation of their functional cooperation. Part 7. After the collection stage of thinking in complexes, we must place the chain complex, a dynamic consecutive joining of individual links into a single chain with meaning carried over from one link to the next. For instance, if the experimental sample is a yellow triangle, the child might pick out a few triangular blocks until his attention is caught by, let us say, the blue color of a block he has just added. He switches to selecting blue blocks of any shape, angular, circular, semicircular. This in turn is sufficient to change the criterion again. Oblivious of color, the child begins to choose rounded blocks. The decisive attribute keeps changing during the entire process. There is no consistency in the type of the bonds or in the manner in which a link of the chain is joined with the one that precedes and the one that follows it. The original sample has no central significance. Each link, once included in a chain complex, is as important as the first and may become the magnet for a series of other objects. The chain formation strikingly demonstrates the perceptually concrete, factual nature of complex thinking. An object included because of one of its attributes enters the complex not just as the carrier of that one trait, but as an individual with all its attributes. The single trait is not abstracted by the child from the rest and is not given a special role as in a concept. In complexes, the hierarchical organization is absent. All attributes are functionally equal. The sample may be disregarded altogether when a bond is formed between two other objects. These objects may have nothing in common with some of the other elements either, and yet be parts of the same chain on the strength of sharing an attribute with still another of its elements. Therefore, the chain complex may be considered the purest form of thinking in complexes. Unlike the associative complex, whose elements are, after all, interconnected through one element, the nucleus of the complex, the chain complex has no nucleus. There are relations between single elements, but nothing more. A complex does not rise above its elements as does a concept. It merges with the concrete objects that compose it. This fusion of the general and the particular, of the complex and its elements, this psychic amalgam, as Werner called it, is the distinctive characteristic of all complex thinking and of the chain complex in particular. Part 8. Because the chain complex is factually inseparable from the group of concrete objects that form it, it often acquires a vague and floating quality. The type and nature of the bonds may change from link to link almost imperceptibly. Often a remote similarity is enough to create a bond. Attributes are sometimes considered similar, not because of genuine likeness, but because of a dim impression that they have something in common. This leads to the fourth type of complex observed in our experiments. It might be called the diffuse complex. The diffuse complex is marked by the fluidity of the very attribute that unites its single elements. Perceptually concrete groups of objects or images are formed by means of diffuse, indeterminate bonds. To go with a yellow triangle, for example, a child would in our experiments pick out trapezoids as well as triangles because they make him think of triangles with their tops cut off. Trapezoids would lead to squares, squares to hexagons, hexagons to semicircles, and finally to circles. Color as the basis of selection is equally floating and changeable. Yellow objects are apt to be followed by green ones. Then green may change the blue to blue and blue to black. Complexes resulting from this kind of thinking are so indefinite as to be in fact limitless. Like a biblical tribe that longed to multiply until it became countless like the stars in the sky, or the sands of the sea, a diffuse complex in the child's mind 
is a kind of family that has limitless powers to expand by adding more and more individuals to the original group. The child's generalizations in the non-practical and non-perceptual areas of his thinking, which cannot be easily verified through perception or practical action, are the real-life parallel of the diffuse complexes observed in the experiments. It is well known that the child is capable of surprising transitions, of startling associations and generalizations, when his thought ventures beyond the boundaries of the small tangible world of his experience. Outside it, he often constructs limitless complexes, amazing in the universality of the bonds they encompass. These limitless complexes, however, are built on the same principles as the circumscribed concrete complexes. In both, the child stays within the limits of concrete bonds between things, but in so far as the first kind of complex comprises objects outside the sphere of his practical cognition, these bonds are naturally based on dim, unreal, unstable attributes. Part 9 To complete the picture of complex thinking, we must describe one more type of complex, the bridge, as it were, between complexes and the final, highest stage in the development of concept formation. We call this type of complex the pseudo-concept, because the generalization formed in the child's mind, although phenotypically resembling the adult concept, is psychologically very different from the concept proper. In its essence, it is still a complex. In the experimental setting, the child produces a pseudo-concept every time he surrounds a sample with objects that could just as well have been assembled on the basis of an abstract concept. For instance, when the sample is a yellow triangle and the child picks out all the triangles in the experimental material, he could have been guided by the general idea or concept of a triangle. Experimental analysis shows, however, that in reality the child is guided by the concrete, visible likeness and has formed only an associative complex limited to a certain kind of perceptual bond. Although the results are identical, the process by which they are reached is not at all the same as in conceptual thinking. We must consider this type of complex in some detail. It plays a predominant role in the child's real-life thinking, and it is important as a transitional link between thinking and complexes and true concept formation. Part 10. Pseudo-concepts predominate over all other complexes in a preschool child's thinking for the simple reason that in real life, complexes corresponding to word meanings are not spontaneously developed by the child. The lines along which a complex develops are predetermined by the meaning a given word already has in the language of adults. In our experiments, the child, freed from the directing influence of familiar words, was able to develop word meanings and form complexes according to his own preferences. Only through the experiment can we gauge the kind and extent of his spontaneous activity in mastering the language of adults. The child's own activity in forming generalizations is by no means quenched, though it is usually hidden from view and driven into complicated channels by the influences of adult speech. The language of the environment, with its stable, permanent meanings, points the way that the child's generalizations will take, but, constrained as it is, the child's thinking proceeds along this preordained path in the manner peculiar to his level of intellectual development. The adult cannot pass on to the child his mode of thinking. He merely supplies the ready-made meaning of a word, around which the child forms a complex. With all the structural, functional, and genetic peculiarities of thinking in complexes, even if the product of his thinking is in fact identical in its content with a generalization that could have been formed by conceptual thinking, the outward similarity between the pseudo-concept and the real concept, which makes it very difficult to unmask this kind of complex, is a major obstacle in the genetic analysis of thought. The functional equivalence of complex and concept, the coincidence in, in practice of many word meanings for the adult and the three-year-old child, the possibility of mutual understanding, and the apparent similarity of their thought processes, have led to the false assumption that all the forms of adult intellectual activity are already present in embryo and child thinking, and that no drastic change occurs at the age of puberty. It is easy to understand the origin of that misconception. The child learns very early a large number of words that mean the same to him and to the adult. 
the mutual understanding of adult and child creates the illusion that the end point in the development of word meaning coincides with the starting point, that the concept is provided ready-made from the beginning, and that no development takes place. The child's acquisition of the language of adults accounts, in fact, for the consonance of his complexes with their concepts. In other words, for the emergence of concept complexes or pseudo-concepts. Our experiments in which the child's thinking is not hemmed in by word meanings demonstrate that if it were not for the prevalence of pseudo-concepts, the child's complexes would develop along different lines from adult concepts, and verbal communication between children and, and adults would be impossible. The pseudo-concept serves as the connecting link between thinking in complexes and thinking in concepts. It is dual in nature, a complex already carrying the germinating seed of a concept. Verbal intercourse with adults thus becomes a powerful factor in the development of the child's concepts. The transition from thinking in complexes to thinking in concepts passes unnoticed by the child because his pseudo-concepts already coincide in content with the adult's concepts. Thus the child begins to operate with concepts to practice conceptual thinking before he is clearly aware of the nature of these operations. This peculiar genetic situation is not limited to the attainment of concepts. It is the rule rather than an exception in the intellectual development of the child. Part 11. We've now seen with the clarity that only experimental analysis can give the various stages and forms of complex thinking. This analysis permits us to uncover the very essence of the genetic process of concept formation in a schematic form, and thus gives us the key to the understanding of the process as it unfolds in real life. But an experimentally induced process of concept formation never mirrors the genetic development exactly as it occurs in life. The basic forms of concrete thinking that we have enumerated appear in reality in mixed states. The morphological analysis given so far must be followed by a functional and genetic analysis. We must try to connect the forms of complex thinking discovered in the experiment with the forms of thought found in the actual development of the child and check the two series of observations against each other. From our experiments, we concluded that at the complex stage, word meanings as perceived by the child refer to the same objects the adult has in mind which ensures understanding between child and adult, but that the child thinks the same thing in a different way, by means of different mental operations. We shall try to verify this proposition by comparing our observations with the data on the peculiarities of child thought, and of primitive thought in general, previously collected by psychological science. If we observe what groups of objects the child links together in transferring the meanings of his first words, and how he goes about it, we discover a mixture of the two forms which we called in our experiments the associative complex and the syncretic image. Let us borrow an illustration from Eidelberger, cited by Werner. On the 251st day of his life, a child applies the word bow wow to a china figurine of a girl that usually stands on the sideboard and that he likes to play with. On the 307th day, he applies bow wow to a dog barking in the yard, to the pictures of his grandparents to a toy dog, and to a clock. On the 331st day, to a fur piece with an animal's head, noticing particularly the glass eyes, and to another fur stole without a head. On the 334th day, to a rubber doll that squeaks when pressed, and on the 396th, to his father's cufflinks. On the 433rd day, he utters the same word at the sight of pearl buttons on a dress, and of a bath thermometer. Werner analyzed this example and concluded that the diverse things called bow wow may be cataloged as follows. First, dogs and toy dogs and small oblong objects resembling the china doll, e.g. the rubber doll and the thermometer. Second, the cufflinks, pearl buttons, and similar small objects. The criterial attribute is an oblong shape or a shiny surface resembling eyes. Clearly the child unites these concrete objects according to the principle of a complex. Such spontaneous complex formations make up the entire first chapter of the developmental history of children's words. There is a well-known frequently cited example of these shifts. A child's use of qua to designate first a duck, swimming, 
in a pond than any liquid, including the milk in his bottle. When he happens to see a coin with an eagle on it, the coin also is called qua, and then any round coin-like object. This is a typical chain complex. Each new object included has some attribute in common with another element, but the attributes undergo endless changes. Complex formation is also responsible for the peculiar phenomenon that one word may, in different situations, have different or even opposite meanings as long as there is some associative link between them. Thus, a child may say before, for both before and after, or tomorrow, for both tomorrow and yesterday. We have here a perfect analogy with some ancient languages, Hebrew, Chinese, Latin, in which one word also sometimes indicated opposites. The Romans, for instance, had one word for high and deep. Such a marriage of opposite meanings is possible only as a result of thinking in complexes. Part 12. There's another very interesting trait of primitive thought that shows us complex thinking in action and points up the difference between pseudo-concepts and concepts. This trait, which Levi Bruhl was the first to note in primitive peoples, Storch in the insane and Piaget in children, is usually called participation. The term is applied to the relationship of partial identity or close interdependence established by primitive thought between two objects or phenomena which actually have neither contiguity nor any other recognizable connection. Levi Bruhl quotes von den Steinen regarding a striking case of participation observed among the Bororo of Brazil who pride themselves on being red parrots. Von den Steinen at first did not know what to make of such a categorical assertion, but finally decided that they really meant it. It was not merely a name they appropriated or a family relationship they insisted upon. What they meant was identity of beings. It seems to us that the phenomenon of participation has not yet received a sufficiently convincing psychological explanation, and this for two reasons. First, investigations have tended to focus on the contents of the phenomenon and to ignore the mental operations involved, i.e. to study the product rather than the process. Second, no adequate attempts have been made to view the phenomenon in the context of the other bonds and relationships formed by the primitive mind. Too often the extreme, the fantastic, like the Bororo notion that they are red parrots, attracts investigation at the expense of less spectacular phenomena. Yet careful analysis shows that even those connections that do not outwardly clash with our logic are formed by the primitive mind on the principles of complex thinking. Since children of a certain age think in pseudo-concepts and words designate to them complexes of concrete objects, their thinking must result in participation, i.e. in bonds unacceptable to adult logic. A particular thing may be included in different complexes on the strength of its different concrete attributes and consequently may have several names. Which one is used depends on the complex activated at the time. In our experiments, we frequently observed instances of this kind of participation where an object was included simultaneously in two or more complexes. Far from being an exception, participation is characteristic of complex thinking. Primitive peoples also think in complexes, and consequently the word in their languages does not function as the carrier of a concept, but as a family name for groups of concrete objects belonging together, not logically, but factually. Storch has shown that the same kind of thinking is characteristic of schizophrenics, who regress from conceptual thought to a more primitive level of mentation, rich in images and symbols. He considers the use of concrete images instead of abstract concepts one of the most distinctive traits of primitive thought. Thus, the child, primitive man, and the insane, much as their thought processes may differ in other important respects, all manifest participation, a symptom of primitive complex thinking, and of the function of words as family names. We therefore believe that Levi Bruhl's way of interpreting participation is incorrect. He approaches the Bororo statements about being red parents from the point of view of our own logic when he assumes that to the primitive mind, too, such an assertion means identity of beings. But since words to the Bororo designate groups of objects, not concepts, their assertion has a different meaning. The word for parrot is the word for a complex that includes parrots and themselves. 
It does not imply identity any more than a family name shared by two related individuals implies that they are one and the same person. Part 13. The history of language clearly shows that complex thinking with all its peculiarities is the very foundation of linguistic development. Modern linguistics distinguishes between the meaning of a word or an expression and its referent, i.e. the object it designates. There may be one meaning in different reference, or different meanings in one referent. Whether we say the victor at Jenna or the loser at Waterloo, we refer to the same person, yet the meaning of the two phrases differs. There is but one category of words, proper names, whose sole function is that of reference. Using this terminology, we might say that the child's and the adult's words coincide in their reference, but not in their meanings. Identity of referent combined with divergence of meaning is also found in the history of languages. A multitude of facts support this thesis. The synonyms existing in every language are one good example. The Russian language has two words for moon, arrived at by different thought processes that are clearly reflected in their etymology. One term derives from the Latin word connoting caprice, inconstancy, fancy. It was obviously meant to stress the changing form that distinguishes the moon from, other, from the other celestial bodies. The originator, the second term, which means measurer, had no doubt been impressed by the fact that time could be measured by lunar phases. Between languages, the same holds true. For instance, in Russian, the word for tailor stems from an old word for a piece of cloth. In French and in German, it means one who cuts. If we trace the history of a word in any language, we shall see, however surprising this may seem at first blush, that its meanings change just as in child thinking. In the example we have cited, bow wow was applied to a series of objects totally disparate from the adult point of view. Similar transfers of meaning, indicative of complex thinking, are the rule rather than the exception in the development of a language. Russian has a term for day and night, the word sutki. Originally it meant a seam, the junction of two pieces of cloth, something woven together. Then it was used for any junction, e.g. of two walls of a house, and hence a corner. It began to be used metaphorically for a twilight, where day and night meet. Then it came to mean the time from one twilight to the next, i.e. the 24-hour sutki of the present. Such diverse things as a seam, a corner, twilight, and 24 hours are drawn into one complex in the course of the development of a word, in the same way as the child incorporates different things into a group on the basis of concrete imagery. What are the laws governing the formation of word families? More often than not, new phenomena or objects are named after unessential attributes, so that the name does not truly express the nature of the thing named. Because a name is never a concept when it first emerges, it is usually both too narrow and too broad. For instance, the Russian word for cow originally meant horned, and the word for mouse, thief. But there is much more to a cow than horns, and to a mouse than pilfering. Thus their names are too narrow. On the other hand, they are too broad, since the same epithets may be applied, and actually are applied in some other languages, to a number of other creatures. The result is a ceaseless struggle within the the developing language between conceptual thought and the heritage of primitive thinking and complexes. The complex created name, based on one attribute, conflicts with the concept for which it has come to stand. In the contest between the concept and the image that gave birth to the name, the image gradually loses out. It fades from consciousness and from memory, and the original meaning of the word is eventually obliterated. Years ago, all ink was black and the Russian word for ink refers to its blackness. This does not prevent us today from speaking of red, green, or blue black ink without noticing the incongruity of the combination. Transfers of names to new objects occur through contiguity or similarity, i.e., on the basis of concrete bonds typical of thinking in complexes. Words in the making in our own era present many examples of the process by which miscellaneous things are grouped together, when we speak of the leg of a table, the elbow of a road, the neck of a bottle, and a bottleneck, we are grouping things in a complex-like fashion. 
In these cases, the visual and functional similarities mediating the transfer are quite clear. Transfer can be determined, however, by the most varied associations, and if it has occurred in the remote past, it is impossible to reconstruct the connections without knowing exactly the historical background of the event. The primary word is not a straightforward symbol for a concept, but rather an image, a picture, a mental sketch of a concept, a short tale about it, indeed, a small work of art. In naming an object by means of such a pictorial concept, man ties it into one group with a number of other objects. In this respect, the process of language creation is analogous to the process of complex formation in the intellectual development of the child. Part 14. Much can be learned about complex thinking from the speech of deaf-mute children, in whose case the main stimulus to the formation of pseudo-concepts is absent. Deprived of verbal intercourse with adults and left to determine for themselves what objects to group under a common name, they form their complexes freely, and the special characteristics of complex thinking appear in pure, clear-cut form. In the sign language of deaf-mutes, touching a tooth may have three different meanings, white, stone, and tooth. All three belong to one complex, whose further elucidation requires an additional pointing or imitative gesture to indicate the object meant in each case. The two functions of a word are, so to speak, physically separated. A deaf-mute touches his tooth and then, by pointing at its surface or by making a throwing gesture, tells us to what object he refers in a given case. To test and supplement our experimental results, we have taken some examples of complex formation from the linguistic development of children, the thinking of primitive peoples, and the development of languages as such. It should be noted, however, that even the normal adult, capable of forming and using concepts, does not consistently operate with concepts in his thinking. Apart from the primitive thought processes of dreams, the adult constantly shifts from conceptual to concrete, complex-like thinking. The transitional pseudo-concept form of thought is not confined to child thinking. We too resort to it very often in our daily life. Part 15. Our investigation led us to divide the process of concept formation into three major phases. We have described two of them, marked by the predominance of the syncretic image and of the complex, respectively, and we come now to the third phase. Like the second, it can be subdivided into several stages. In reality, the new formations do not necessarily appear only after complex thinking has run the full course of its development. In a rudimentary shape, they can be observed long before the child begins to think in pseudo-concepts. Essentially, however, they belong in the third division of our schema of concept formation. If complex thinking is one root of concept formation, the forms we are about to describe are a second independent root. They have a distinct genetic function different from that of complexes in the child's mental development. The principal function of complexes is to establish bonds and relationships. Complex thinking begins the unification of scattered impressions. By organizing discrete elements of experience into groups, it creates a basis for later generalizations. But the advanced concept presupposes more than unification. To form such a concept, it is also necessary to abstract, to single out elements and to view the abstracted elements apart from the totality of the concrete experience in which they are embedded. In genuine concept formation, it is equally important to unite and to separate Synthesis must be combined with analysis. Complex thinking cannot do both. Its very essence is overabundance, overproduction of connections, and weakness in abstraction. To fulfill the second requirement is the function of the processes that ripen only during the third phase in the development of concept formation, though their beginnings reach back into much earlier periods. In our experiment, the first step toward abstraction was made when the child grouped together maximally similar objects, e.g. objects that were small and round or red and flat. Since the test material contains no identical objects, even the maximally similar are dissimilar in some respects. It follows that in picking out these best matches, 
The child must be paying more attention to some traits of an object than to others, giving them preferential treatment, so to speak. The attributes which, added up, make an object maximally similar to the sample become the focus of attention and are thereby, in a sense, abstracted from the attributes to which the child attends less. This first attempt at abstraction is not obvious as such, because the child abstracts a whole group of traits without clearly distinguishing one from another. Often the abstraction of such a group of attributes is based only on a vague, general impression of the object's similarity. Still, the global character of the child's perception has been breached, and object's attributes have been divided into two parts unequally attended to, a beginning of positive and negative abstraction. An object no longer enters a complex in toto, with all its attributes, some are denied admission. If the object is impoverished thereby, the attributes that caused its inclusion in the complex acquire a sharper relief in the child's thinking. Part 16. During the next stage in the development of abstraction, the grouping of objects on the basis of maximum similarity is superseded by grouping on the basis of a single attribute, e.g. only round objects or only flat ones. Although the product is undistinguishable from the product of a concept, these formations, like pseudo-concepts, are only precursors of true concepts. Following the usage introduced by Gruss, we shall call such formations potential concepts. Potential concepts result from a species of isolating abstraction of such a primitive nature that it is present to some degree not only in very young children but even in animals. Hands can be trained to respond to one distinct attribute in different objects, such as color or shape, if it indicates accessible food. Kohler's chimpanzees, once they had learned to use a stick as a tool, used other long objects when they needed a stick and none was available. Even in very young children, objects or situations that have some features in common evoke like responses. At the earliest pre-verbal stage, Children clearly expect similar situations to lead to identical outcomes. Once a child has associated a word with an object, he readily applies it to a new object that impresses him as similar in some ways to the first. Potential concepts, then, may be formed either in the sphere of perceptual or in that of practical action-bound thinking, on the basis of similar impressions in the first case and of similar functional meanings in the second. The latter are an important source of potential concepts. It is well known that until early school age, functional meanings play a very important role in child thinking. When asked to explain a word, a child will tell what the object the word designates can do, or, more often, what can be done with it. Even abstract concepts are often translated into the language of concrete action. Quote, reasonable means when I am hot and don't stand in a draft. End quote. Potential concepts already play a part in complex thinking, insofar as abstraction occurs also in complex formation. Associative complexes, for instance, presuppose the abstraction of one trait common to different units, but as long as complex thinking predominates, the abstracted trait is unstable, has no privileged position, and easily yields its temporary dominance to other traits. In potential concepts proper, a trait once abstracted is not easily lost again among the other traits. The concrete totality of traits has been destroyed through its abstraction, and the possibility of unifying the traits on a different basis opens up. Only the mastery of abstraction, combined with advanced complex thinking, enables the child to progress to the formation of genuine concepts. A concept emerges only when the abstracted traits are synthesized anew and the resulting abstract synthesis becomes the main instrument of thought. The decisive role in this process, as our experiments have shown, is played by the word, deliberately used to direct all the part processes of advanced concept formation. Part 17. In our experimental study of the intellectual processes of adolescence, we observed how the primitive syncretic and complex forms of thinking gradually subside, Potential concepts are used less and less, and true concepts begin to be formed, seldom at first, then with increasing frequency. 
Even after the adolescent has learned to produce concepts, however, he does not abandon the more elementary forms. They continue for a long time to operate, indeed to predominate, in many areas of his thinking. Adolescence is less a period of completion than one of crisis and transition. The transitional character of adolescent thinking becomes especially evident when we observe the actual functioning of the newly acquired concepts. Experiments specially devised to study the adolescent's operations with concepts bring out, in the first place, a striking discrepancy between his ability to form concepts and his ability to define them. The adolescent will form and use a concept quite correctly in a concrete situation, but will find it strangely difficult to express that concept in words, and the verbal definition will, in most cases, be much narrower than might have been expected from the way he used the concept. The same discrepancy occurs also in adult thinking, even at very advanced levels. This confirms the assumption that concepts evolve in ways differing from deliberate conscious elaboration of experience in logical terms. Analysis of reality with the help of concepts precedes analysis of the concepts themselves. The adolescent encounters another obstacle when he tries to apply a concept that he has formed in a specific situation to a new set of objects or circumstances where the attributes synthesized in the concept appear in configurations differing from the original one. An example would be the application to everyday objects of the new concept, small and tall, evolved on test blocks. Still, the adolescent is usually able to achieve such a transfer at a fairly early stage of development. Much more difficult than the transfer itself is the task of defining a concept when it is no longer rooted in the original situation and must be formulated on a purely abstract plane, without reference to any concrete situation or impressions. In our experiments, the child or adolescent who had solved the problem of concept formation correctly very often descended to a more primitive level of thought in giving a verbal definition of the concept and began simply to enumerate the various objects to which the concept applied in the particular setting. In this case, he operated with a name as with a concept, but defined it as a complex, a form of thought vacillating between complex and concept, and typical of that transitional age. The greatest difficulty of all is the application of a concept, finally grasped and formulated on the abstract level, to new concrete situations that must be viewed in these abstract terms a kind of transfer usually mastered only toward the end of the adolescent period. The transition from the abstract to the concrete proves just as arduous for the youth as the earlier transition from the concrete to the abstract. Our experiments leave no doubt that on this point, at any rate, the description of concept formation given by traditional psychology, which simply reproduce the schema of formal logic, is totally unrelated to reality. According to the classical school, Concept formation is achieved by the same process as the family portrait in Galton's composite photographs. These are made by taking pictures of different members of the family on the same plate so that the family traits common to several people stand out with an extraordinary vividness while the differing personal traits of individuals are blurred by the superimposition. A similar intensification of traits shared by a number of objects is supposed to occur in concept formation. According to traditional theory, the sum of these traits is the concept. In reality, as some psychologists have long ago noted, and as our experiments show, the path by which adolescents arrive at concept formation never conforms to this logical schema. When the process of concept formation is seen in all its complexity, it appears as a movement of thought within the pyramid of concepts constantly alternating between two directions, from the particular to the general, and from the general to the particular. Our investigation has shown that a concept is formed not through the interplay of associations, but through an intellectual operation in which all the elementary mental functions participate in a specific combination. This operation is guided by the use of words as the means of actively centering attention of abstracting certain traits synthesizing them and symbolizing them by a sign. 
The processes leading to concept formation develop along two main lines. The first is complex formation. The child unites diverse objects in groups under a common family name. This process passes through various stages. The second line of development is the formation of potential concepts based on singling out certain common attributes. In both, the use of the word is an integral part of the developing processes and the word maintains its guiding function in the formation of genuine concepts to which these processes lead.